This is the Hinckley Institute Radio Hour on KCPW. I'm Ross Chambliss. This week, Salih Gadi Johar, an author and activist on the problem of human trafficking in his home country, Eritrea, spoke at the University of Utah. Human trafficking is often described as modern-day slavery and is indeed a global problem where people are essentially treated as possessions, controlled and exploited, and forced into prostitution or slave labor. But in Northern Africa, according to a human rights report released this month titled The Human Trafficking cycle, Sinai and beyond, since 2009, thousands of refugees, men, women, and children, fleeing desperate circumstances in Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Sudan, have been abducted and held for ransom in the Sinai Desert near the Israeli border. It's estimated that 95% of these people, or roughly 8,000 of them, originate from Johar's native country, Eritrea. Other similar reports, such as the one that aired on This American Life in August 2013, also document how people in this part of the world are being abducted by Bedouin gangs and held prisoner and tortured, while their relatives, friends, or sympathetic strangers are pressured into paying enormous ransoms. Some reports on human trafficking in the Sinai Desert also describe cases where hostages were killed and their organs, usually kidneys, were cut out by traffickers and sold inside and outside of Egypt. But these reports have found no evidence of a link to any commercial organ trade. Yet, as Johar describes, even when these victims manage to buy their freedom, their quandary usually doesn't end. On October 3rd of this year, 366 Eritrean refugees who had each paid thousands of dollars in ransoms to traffickers drown in the Mediterranean Sea off Lampedusa Island during an attempt to sail for safety to Italy. Salih Johar was born and raised in Eritrea, but is now a U.S. citizen living in California. He recently published a novel on the ordeal of Eritreans suffering from human trafficking titled Miriam Was Here. This Hinckley Institute Radio Hour was recorded live with an audience of students at the Hinckley Institute of Politics at the University of Utah on December 10th, 2013. Many years ago, I was in a taxi going somewhere north in Thailand. And while we were driving on the road, the taxi ran over a snake. Obviously, the snake was dead. But the driver insisted on getting out of the car, going to where the snake was. He picked the stick and he kept hitting the dead snake. I was just watching. What are you doing, I asked. He said, snakes have a habit of coming back and haunting whoever killed them. So I don't want uh, to take a chance. And after killing it, it was almost flat with the asphalt. He went to the side of the road. He dug a hole to make sure that it doesn't get up and he buried it. I have lived with a lot of superstition in Africa so I was not surprised but I kept thinking this guy must have been very scared of snakes. I'll come back to that. I'm very excited to speak to you. I hope most of you will be the politicians of the future by the virtue of you studying political science. You know that the current politicians have been letting us down for a long time and I hope with this generation things would change. To me, those who study and pursue a career in politics, particularly when you live in a country which is a superpower, are expected to play an important role in the safety and well-being of the world. The rest of the disciplines economics, engineering, and all others follow politics. In a politically impoverished country, the social well-being of the society is in danger. Good politics maintains a good society and thus gets humanity closer to its goal of pursuing happiness. Unless, as we'll see in a while, one's happiness is derived from the suffering of others. Over the years, politics and politicians lost the glamour. Their jobs have become akin to gambling. And in turn, gambling has become or changed its name to a game, just an innocent game, not a social vice anymore. In the past, a gambler would be considered an outcast, an untrusted individual in society. Today, gamblers are featured in TV shows and are treated as stars. The opposite happened to politicians. In the time of Benjamin Franklin, to be an ambassador carried heavy responsibilities. It was an important and prestigious position. Not everyone could be an ambassador. You would not find the equivalence of Franklin and Kennedy in today's ambassadors. Today, Kennedy probably wouldn't accept a position of an ambassador. And if he did, he would probably resign in frustration. Ambassadors do not have the frequent audience as in the past with, for example, the British Prime Minister, a position that has become a dull shadow of its glorious past. This has happened because advancement in the field of transportation, communication, information technology, and the rest. President Obama calls world leaders and talks to them directly. He can eat breakfast on a plane on his way to London, meet whoever he's meeting for a couple of hours, and probably return to his home, the White House, in the same day, thus diminishing the role of an ambassador. But that is not my concern 
for today. I'm concerned with what has happened with foreign policy, which has deteriorated as well. That is why tragedy of human trafficking and cruel organ harvesting is going unpunished. In the past, elected or officials appointed by elected representatives ran the foreign policy of governments. And here I'm talking about the Western world. The rest, at least in this context, are inconsequential. To cope with modern development, Western governments have followed their corporations in outsourcing their tasks. Foreign policy is subcontracted, outsourced. The only consolation is that they are not outsourcing it to China, like in the manufacturing of sweatshirts, gadgets, toys. The tasks are outsourced to shady entities with unelected officials, unaccountable officials. The execution of foreign policy by freelancers, the political NGOs. Yes, it has become an industry with a nine to five career jobs. Western governments are treating third world countries as a franchise given to different political NGOs who have become more visible and better funded compared to the charitable humanitarian organizations that survive mostly due to the dedication of a few blessed people whose aim is to help the poor and the destitute. Not many of those who operate under the guise of conflict resolution, democratization and all the good sounding terms have lifted a finger to pressure the UN or their governments to do something about human trafficking and the gangs operating with impunity, particularly in the Sinai Desert, for example. Except for USAID, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and a few other small outfits with noble ideas, civic duty-minded people who really work hard to better the world, the rest have been big disappointments, at least to the third world. I've been waging this one-man fight that goes nowhere for a while now. And many people tell me, Saleh, he cannot fight well-entrenched, well-funded, influential NGOs. You cannot win. I do not fight to win. That is the yardstick of corporations and people who are driven by their ego. I fight to satisfy my conscience. I do what I have to do. Winning and losing is not my concern. But if enough people fight for a right cause, certainly win, meaning their cause wins. I looked up in Wikipedia the sixth degree of separation theory. I'm sure some of you will know it. It's a theory that states that everyone and everything is six or fewer steps away by way of introduction from any other person in the world so that a chain of a framed, of a framed statements can be made to connect any two people in a maximum of six steps anywhere in the world. This is from Wikipedia. That assumed that there were 1.5 billion people in the world. That could be revised now as we are six or above. But the entire social network mediums like Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter and the rest, they build their platforms based on such theories. It's a topic for mathematicians, social behavior scientists, algorithms and the rest. What about countries that are not very mobile? So sites like my country that is roughly Three million people, give or take a million, because we never had a census since the 1950s. I would say, in our case, the degree of separation would be much less than six. I learned the population of Utah is just around three million. Now I will let you imagine, God forbid, if 366 inhabitants of Utah, Utah drowned in the Great Salt Lake in just one day. That is what happened to my compatriots from Eritrea 10 weeks ago on October 3rd. In that day, 300 66 Eritrean victims of human trafficking drowned near Lampedusa in Italy. To Eritreans, that was not a mere story. The degree of separation, as I told you, is so low that I know many victims who are friends of people I know, or those relatives of neighbors who perished in that accident. I know the father of one of the victims when I was a child. We played football together. Now he lost his child. A heart-wrenching incident happened in that tragic day. One of the drowned was a woman who gave birth the moment she drowned. When the rescuers arrived, they pulled her up only to discover her baby is still connected to her. The umbilical cord was still intact, but both were dead. To us, human trafficking is not an intellectual curiosity. It's a real tragedy that leaves us in continuous state of mourning and sadness. In the last six years alone, it is estimated that about 8,000 Eritreans lost their lives in the Sinai Desert alone. Over a thousand people drowned in the Mediterranean Sea. Thousands more in the Sahara Desert crossing to Libya from where they planned to continue to Europe or head east towards the Sinai to Israel. There are around 40,000 Eritreans who entered Israel. Almost all reached there through 
the Sinai Bedouin human traffickers. Many perished before they could make it to the Israeli barbed wire. Many were shot by Egyptian border patrol, and many just succumbed. Others were killed and their organ, organs harvested. A recent report estimates the traffickers made around six hundred million dollars on that route alone in the last six years. In Sinai, dozens of gangs are engaged in the crime of human trafficking. Harvested human organs is the major cash crop of Sinai. Thousands of victims went through the blackmailing and ransom rackets of Sinai. Many were raped, tortured, killed, and their human organs harvested, and their bodies were thrown in the desert where wild animals fed. The racket is everywhere. Ransom, which could reach as high as 50,000 per person, is paid, collected, rather, in Israel, the United States, Europe, everywhere, including in my country, Eritrea, where there is a network of collaborators with the trafficking gangs. Eritrean communities abroad are going through a lot, selling their properties, depleting their lifelong savings, borrowing, collecting donations in churches and mosques, and social gatherings, to pay for the ransom of their relatives, to free a relative. If they don't pay, the traffickers harvest the human organs of the victims. And the organs, mainly kidneys, are sold in many places, including New Jersey, for $400,000 apiece. An important fact check here. In 2011, there was a case in which a New York man pled guilty to conspiring to import and sell harvested organs obtained in Israel to recipients in Trenton, New Jersey, in exchange for $120,000 or more. However, there was never any substantiated connection with refugees, Eritrean or otherwise, in the Sinai region. U.S. federal law prohibits anyone to knowingly buy or sell organs for transplant, and the practice is illegal just about everywhere else in the world. But demand globally for kidneys far outstrips the supply. As a result, a thriving black market for kidneys exists around the world. You're listening to the Hinckley Institute Radio Hour on KCBW. In a moment, we'll return to Salih Gadi Johar and his talk on the plight of Eritrean refugees and human trafficking in the Sinai Desert. You're listening to the Hinckley Institute Radio Hour. I'm Ross Chambliss. Salih Gadi Johar, an author and activist and a native to Eritrea, spoke last week at the University of Utah. For Eritrea, we have lost generation. Those being victimized by the Eritrean regime and then by the human traffickers are mainly young men. Loading them would have negative consequences in the future of the country. The long-term effects are great. This age and gender imbalances will certainly have disastrous implications in the future, particularly in terms of reproduction. We cried, we appealed to the world to take action, deaf ears. Maybe our voice was low. We don't have loudspeakers, we don't have the mics needed. The lives of those young people seems are not as valuable as a barrel of oil. There are a few exceptions. A few months ago, Ira Glass of NPR talked about the issue of human trafficking in a program, uh, This American Life. But that's hardly enough to affect action. We need more Ira Glasses. There comes my indignation the NGOs. When the human trafficking event started to unfold in its present magnitude, one would expect the world to take action. Those who should pressure for action were sitting in offices or traveling the world with the pretext of compiling a report about human trafficking. Very mechanical indeed. Would it be wrong to hire a mercenary force to blow up the Bedouin camps in Sinai. Of course not. Governments have been blowing up places for trivial reasons, less significant than that. Here, you could ask me, in fact, you could challenge me, why don't the Eritreans do it themselves? Why do Eritreans pay ransom? If they didn't pay, the kidnapping would probably stop. But first, what would anyone in this room do if his sister, his brother, husband, wife, child fell in a hostage situation and risked the gruesome death at the hands of human trafficker? And if he was asked to pay a ransom, what would anyone do? Uh, that would answer the first question. This, I think, is a moral question, not a legal one, neither a political one. Second, a victim cannot be blamed for being a victim. My people have been victims for over 20 years under the current regime. Like all underdeveloped nations, Eritreans depend on their children to make a living. Villagers depend on the entire family to farm their land and harvest enough to survive. In our case, the government decided that it owns the youth the moment they reach 11th grade at puberty. Thereafter, they are hauled to military camps for the final year of high school. This has been going on since 1993. Then follows the compulsory national service whose time extends 
indefinitely. I have a, a relative who has been serving, sometimes carrying a gun and running from one battle to another, sometimes building roads, sometimes tending to a general's farm or building a house for him for the last 16 years with no pay. He was forcefully conscripted in 1997 when he was 18. Now he is 34, not married, never had a chance to have a home to pursue his education or to help his parents. Eritrean news are spread all over the country in slave labor locations and their labor is extracted for free. Nefsen, a Canadian mining company, profits from such slave labor. Again, another clarification here. Nevson Resources is a Canadian mining company and the first to develop a large-scale copper mine operation in Eritrea. In January 2013, Human Rights Watch reported that Nevson had not taken careful steps to ensure that their government-contracted labor force did not involve exploited workers. Company officials for Nevson have said that their operations in Eritrea benefits the country and that they have no connections with slave labor. Supposedly, the enlisted are paid 400 nafa a month. That is equal to $8 a month. In addition to that, the regime in Eritrea is trigger happy. Endless wars with all our neighbors. We had war with Sudan, we had war with Ethiopia, Djibouti, and Yemen, all of our four neighbors. Now, it's provoking the U.S., and I'm serious about this. The Eritrean regime was at war with Ethiopia over a border town. The war ended in 2000. We lost 18,000 people from the Eritrean side only. 20 years after gaining independent statehood, Eritrea has emerged as one of the largest refugee-producing countries on the African continent, as well as the most militarized societies in the world. And since then, it's estimated that 5,000 people escape the country on a monthly basis, despite the shoot-to-kill order on the borders, through which the frustrated youth escape. To date, there are about 80,000 refugees in Ethiopia, around 125,000 refugees in Sudan, on top of the already residing in Sudan since 1967, and who are estimated in the neighborhood of half a million people in Sudanese camps and towns. The UNHCR has closed the chapter on them. After the independence of Eritrea, closed the chapter and they said these people can be assimilated and nothing has happened for the last 23 years they've been living in refugee camps. Trying to escape this reality is an opportunity for human traffic. UN Monitoring Group for Somalia and Eritrea has implicated senior officials of the Eritrean regime for involvement in the racket of human trafficking and smuggling. Now, if such rogue regimes are not stopped in time, matters certainly deteriorate and there would be a repeat of familiar actions of involvement in larger scales. Just like what we witnessed in Iraq, Somalia, the pirate activities in the Indian Ocean a few years ago, and so on and so forth. And those who watch from a distance now would be forced to get involved. The U.S. might have to put boots on the ground and suffering worse, and people here would have to cope with coffins and wasted resources. Isn't it better to try to stop it now? This is my message. As I tried to explain in my recent book, Miriam was here, human trafficking is a result of oppression and enslavement of Eritreans by a totalitarian regime. Human trafficking is a repercussion of tyranny and lack of respect for human rights, democracy, and basic justice. In short, it is the result of denying of basic freedom that a citizen should enjoy. Human trafficking is a worldwide phenomenon. There are hundreds of papers, books, movies, and documentaries that address it. I am focusing on Eritrea for two reasons. One, simply because I'm an Eritrean, and it's natural that it touches me more than the rest. I feel duty-bound to do what I can. The second reason is more important. The percentage of Eritrean victims of human trafficking is by far the largest compared to the other countries of the region. For example, the ratio of Eritrean refugees in Italy, the major gateway to Europe, is 2 to 1 compared to Syrians, taking into account the population of Syria, which is eight times bigger than that of Eritrea. It means for every Syrian refugee, there are nine Eritrean refugees. And the world knows the carnage that's raging in Syria. It's awful. Yet, despite that, Eritreans are outdoing Syrians by nine to one in escaping their country. Now, you have an idea how bad it is in Eritrea, particularly for the youth, mostly your age. The ratio reflects the level of dissatisfaction that Eritrean youth have reached. I do not know what would stop human trafficking. I know what would stop the supply of Eritrean victims to the criminals. The tyranny in Eritrea should be weeded out from the roots. I have taken a lesson on that from the taxi driver in Thailand who buried the snake. Now, what has the West done to elongate the suffering of Eritreans to the extent that they became commodities of human trafficking? Well, there is this policy mainly followed by Europe. It's called positive engagement. 
as if one has to engage a criminal. Europeans believe that if they treat tyrants nicely, they would miraculously become nicer to their people. Wrong. On the contrary, they have been given the tyrants legitimacy, funds, and a cover to continue to do what they do best, increase their oppression of their citizens. The West always cajoles and flirts with tyrants who wreak havoc in the lives of helpless people. I believe that democracy, a nation of free people that, like the US, should have nothing to do with tyrannies. Any relations should be Severed. If they cannot help the people attain their freedom, then they should stop interfering and leave issues to their own devices. If it is a confrontation between the people and authoritarian regimes, I am confident no tyrant would survive. Policies that are undermine freedom of citizens for a barrel of oil or for trivial national interest should be shunned. Only then we can solve the problems associated not only with human trafficking, but with the overall lack of respect of human rights, freedom and liberty. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to the Hinckley Institute Radio Hour and a recording of Salih Gadi Johar, who spoke last week at the University of Utah. This program was brought to you by the Hinckley Institute of Politics at the University of Utah and KCBW. You can hear this program again and other podcasts on KCBW's website and join us every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. for other forums on local, national, and international issues important to people living in Utah. I'm Ross Chambliss, and this is KCBW. KCBW.